All right. Um, thank you for the introduction. I appreciate it. Uh, my name is Kent Harries. I'm from the University of Pittsburgh in the United States. I've been working with bamboo for, for an awfully long time now. Um, I love that picture with the, that we saw, presentations going away, um, with Cosro and, and, and Bhavna. That, and, and that's an important aspect of what we're doing here, is we need that generational movement. Bhavna is almost like a third generation of bamboo researcher now. For those of you who don't know, she was my PhD student. And she studied at, at Puki Rio for a while. And so it's wonderful to see the, the, the transition from, um, from Cosro and, and, and handing off to the younger generation. And I'm sure Bhavna would be very happy if I referred to her as the younger generation. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about bamboo standardization. And I'm talking about it as a structural engineer and talking about it in the context of the ISO documents. So what I want to do is I want to start off with a question, and, and in the interest of time, I'm not going to go around and ask everybody what their answers are. But I want you to think in terms of building structures. Why do we have codes and standards? And of course, because there's students here, everybody's quiet. What's the primary reason for codes and standards? Shout out an answer. I'll ask the faculty to shout out an answer. I need, I need any. Usually, this is the first answer, right? Why do we have codes and standards in the built environment? Safety in the built environment. And that's certainly paramount. But we've got to recognize that the codes and standards process also serves industry interests, both to promote industry and to protect industry. And possibly most important, I need more room to walk, I pace. Um, is to communicate our intent as designers to the various people that need to understand what we're doing. We've got a bunch of structural engineers, we have a number of structural engineers in the room, there's no question that I can communicate with you, but I need to communicate with code officials, I need to communicate with owners, I need to communicate ultimately with all sorts of other people. And so <clears throat> the development of construction industry codes and standards really serve certainly technical means, technical um, uh, objectives, but also social and economic objectives. Do we have a, oh yeah, there we go. Social and economic objectives. And they provide this common language, this lingua franca, so that we can all speak about a product, a process, an objective, and hopefully come up with uh, all speaking at the same level. So we need to be able to communicate not only to engineers, but to code building officials, inspectors, and ultimately the owners of the product, of the project, excuse me. And so codes and standards serve both technical and social realms and provide that common frame of reference. Now, when we kind of move into these non-conventional materials, most of us are fairly comfortable, at least as engineers, with steel and concrete and masonry and timber. But as we move into these non-conventional materials, codes and standards serve another purpose. They help us to advocate. Oh, this is, this is getting weird. <laughs> Go back. <laughs> I do not like that. OK, I, I'll need it afterwards, I assure you. Uh, thank you, is that they help to develop this acceptance. We Coupled with advocacy, well, the advocacy is in this room, isn't it? We're all advocates of bamboo, I hope. Um, and so these codes and standards will help us to do this. And, and I'm talking about other marginalized materials as well. I do a lot of work with earthen construction, with adobe, with rammed earth, and with cob, and things like that. So I want to differentiate, and, and I think this is important in most languages, but certainly in English, there's a difference between a, um, sorry, I'm reading my slides. I need them up there. <laughs> they're my cue cards. They're, they're timing out or something like that. I'm not certain what's happening. Um, there's a difference between a material standard and a standard material, and I think this works in most languages, so you're going to have to translate that to, to your own. Um, context. But if we think about conventional engineering materials, steel and timber in particular, we have material specifications and we have, and those have sort of evolved into standard materials. If you go and get an I-beam around the world, it's fairly standard. Ironically, timber design, what, two by fours and, and, and plywood are four by eight feet. Why is it four by eight feet, right? But that's a standard. Nobody uses feet except us. 
Nobody wants to use them. But we end up with these standard materials. When we move into the non-conventional realm, you can't have a standard material. There's not gonna be a standard earth block. There's certainly not standard bamboo. Um, I, I, I'm actually a big fan of hay bale construction, straw bale construction. There's certainly not standard straw bales. But we still have material standards, ways that we can communicate about these materials. And that's what we're talking about. So what I wanna do is move on to bamboo. And, and today talk a little bit about our, our current suite of standards that we have. And so it's useful to look at a little bit of history, um, also invoking Dr. Gavami again. <clears throat> so um, I'm talking about the ISO standards, International Standards Organization. And back in the 1980s, there was proposed a, a suite of standards for full comb bamboo. And today I am talking about full comb round bamboo. Tomorrow I'll talk about engineered bamboo. Um, it took about 10 years. Funding, interestingly, from the Dutch government um, allowed work to proceed on the original ISO standards, the 22156 and 22157, which is the bamboo structural design and then the material properties, the test methods. And those were really led by Jules Janssen, who, who passed away sadly a few years ago. Um, Cosro was heavily involved in this effort as well. And this is back in, in, in 2004, these were first published, and, and I refer to these as version zero. They are intent signifying documents. We want to design with bamboo. But as a designer, they're not really that useful. I mean, no offense to the authors of them, but I couldn't design anything with them. They tell me what I should be doing, but they don't tell me how to do it. Um, so now, jumping ahead about uh, uh, 10 years, we started looking at, well, we need to revise these. Standards don't live and, and just stop. And so a group of us got together and started looking at, at this process. ISO, for those of you who are involved in ISO, is a bureaucracy. It's a slow grind. In English, we talk about making the sausage. It, it really is a horrible process. But we have, um, in, in recent years then, produced a suite of standards, that, and that's what I'm going to be talking about today. We've updated the, the mechanical test standard, we've updated the, uh, the design standard, and we've introduced a new standard on grading. A couple things I want to point out here. We changed the title to bamboo structures. We're not, just, we're not talking about bamboo in general, we're now talking about building structures. And we've also identified now culms in the title, so the round bamboo. There are three new standards coming. Um, one of them is actually out, excuse me, um, that talk about engineered bamboo. So briefly, this suite of standards. Mechanical test methods. Um, 22157 discusses multiple test methods. It also talks about moisture content and whatnot. All sorts of ways to characterize bamboo. We need to consider this as a toolbox. It's not something that we have to use all the tools at once but we need to use the ones that are appropriate for our, 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 our jobs. And there's lots of very typical ones, compression, tension, and then some ones that get a little bit more complicated. And this was actually a lot of what we were talking about yesterday in the lab. Interestingly, and something that people aren't as familiar with, is 19624 is a standard that allows you to develop grading methodologies for bamboo. And if bamboo is going to be developed in the construction industry, grading is critical. We all know the variability of the material. We've got to be able to talk about it. And what does grading allow us to do? It gives us that lingua franca. We can talk about bamboo without talking about the individual properties, potentially. The important aspect of this, um, and probably the most useful, is actually the, the annex, which gives examples of how we might grade bamboo. And we are using this right now, and there are examples, and they're starting to be published as well, um, of how this has been um, applied. Now we move on to the structural standard. So I've got the material properties. I hopefully have a way to grade this bamboo to identify what I'm looking at. Um, and now I want to build something with it. So I'm going to spend the rest of my time, I probably don't have too much time um, because I tend to go on and on, talking about the building standard, talking about building structures. So I tell my students, if you have a code, what do you do? The very first thing is you open and you check the scope. You've got to make sure that you're looking at the right product. So this is a limited scope document. We talk about one and two story buildings not exceeding seven meters in height. So today, 
This is essentially a residential document. It is limited. The idea is hopefully we will be able to expand this as we, as we go on. So we had version zero back in 2004. This is version one. And we know if we use Zoom, we're on what? Version 26, right? You know, so it's going to take some time. I'm going to highlight just a couple of the things that we've done with this standard to make it useful. And, and now I'm talking to the structural engineers. The one thing that we've done is we've addressed an, an allowable stress design approach, which is appropriate for, for non-conventional materials, but we've also addressed an allowable capacity design approach. And this allows you to get around the stress, get around the mechanics, and actually design systems that potentially can solve your problem and, and not identify each and every limit state. What it does with the allowable capacity design, it also allows us to introduce grading, and so we can have different grades of material. We can determine their, let's say, flexural capacity, the example I'm using here, and then we can tabulate these. And engineers love tables. Architects love them even more because they're easy. We can look things up, and we've done this, and there's actually a very nice paper that was put out, uh, examples of how we can develop design tables, span tables for bamboo. We also, Permit because we have to. We don't have all the answers. We don't have all the answers for steel and concrete either. And we permit a, 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 an approach, essentially, that allows design by testing. This isn't going to work if you're building one structure. Nobody wants to design a, a test structure, test it, and then that's OK. But a lot of these projects, and we're aiming it at the types of projects where we may be building thousands of homes. We've got a project in, in or the project was working in the Philippines where you know, we built 350 homes over the course of a year. At that point, we can start now design by testing. We can design a roof structure, we can test it, we can validate its capacity, and then use that along with grading to build our structures. And instead of reinventing the wheel, we've engaged, and this is the example for connections, and connections are, are, are difficult to design, so we can design them by testing, and we're using existing standards. These are standards that people should be aware of. They generally are coming from the timber industry, and so we have a methodology as well. And for those of you who are interested, there's a brand new paper that takes an example of this and starts from the beginning, goes to the end, and shows how we can design a connection or how we can determine the capacity of a connection, and that paper just came out. We then also look at all sorts of other things that are very important in bamboo design. I don't want to spend huge amounts of time, but there's a lot of time spent on the propensity, the, the, the fact that bamboo splits. We all know that. And that's not a really good thing when you're connecting to it and, and using it in, in, <clears throat> in structures. And the concept of structural and member redundancy. One of the things that's ingrained in this document is design for replacement. That doesn't happen in other materials, but we're actually encouraging the designer to design so that when we do have a comb that is damaged, that rots what, or, or splits or whatnot, that we can safely take it out of the structure, replace it very easily. That's not something we do in steel. It's not something we do in concrete. And this is necessary in this particular material, we feel. And we've, we reward the designer for doing this for designing redundant structures that allow us to take out a member without shoring it up and everything else. Uh, we've used the service classes. We've used typical ISO or, 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 or EC service classes uh, based on equilibrium moisture content. We've got a lot of guidance for durable structures as well. Durability obviously is a big issue, especially if you want your structure to last for 50 years. Um, other things that affects of elevated surface temperature are addressed. Fire is also addressed very, very briefly. Um, issues of maintenance and inspection, replacing members, I've talked about that. Direct discussion of connections. And this code still includes uh, barricade construction, and I'll talk about that in just a moment. So if we talk about durability, one of the things that's important in, in, in designing bamboo structures is we're not going to design them for all environments. We do need to protect bamboo. And what we do is we emphasize in this document and again reward the designer for protection by design, durability by design, having large roof eaves, making sure that the bamboo doesn't get wet, protecting it from UV. And those are the kind of structures that we need to be building. And so we permit the use of bamboo in, in, in 
for those of you in, in, who are familiar with the Euro codes, will recognize these in, in categories 1, 2, and 3.1, limited use in 3.2, and we certainly would not want to be designing in uses 4 and 5. Not to say you couldn't, but you wouldn't want to design them the way we're talking about. We talk a lot about connections and we've adopted an approach to connections that's a little bit different. We talk about how does the force get transferred from one element to the other. So a particular bamboo connection may have three or four different force transfer mechanisms as part of it. For those of you who are familiar, and I'm not even gonna pretend to pronounce his last name, this is based largely on the work of Dr. Andri from Indonesia. Uh, he did a, a, a fantastic doctorate about 10 years ago in, in Germany. Um, it's been reproduced in, in a couple of formats. And, and this is a great way to look at connections because it eliminates the actual uh, detail. We talk about force transfer instead. We do have some prescriptive guidance for very simple connections that are common. These are very conservative at this point and again would push the designer probably to look at design by testing. And again, if you're building a thousand homes or, 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 or you're, you're, you're trying to develop a business like that, that makes sense. And you, and you come to Dr. Homer and he'll do all the testing, right? How much? How much does it cost? Um, lots of examples of, of connection design and what have you from very, very simple to very complex. And at the moment, the document still includes barricade construction. Now, this is a little bit different kind of construction. These are the, plastic, the rendered walls of very light bamboo. The next version of this standard, our plan is to take this out and, build, and make a separate standard out of this, because this is a different type of construction um, with a little bit of different expertise. We didn't have the time, and the rules of ISO wouldn't let us do it this time. We'll do it next time. Um, so you heard it here first. We'll do it next time, I promise. Um, so kind of in summing up, and hopefully I'm on time, I, I don't know, or I'm over, it doesn't matter. Oh, okay, good. Oh, that means I can go for another three hours? Sorry. I, I gave a lecture for these guys the other morning, and it's like, uh, we got to take a break. All right, uh, there we go. Um, so this particular document is not perfect. There's no question. It is version one. And, and go look on your computer and all the software you're using. You're not using version one, probably, right? But it's a huge step forward, and there are examples, uh, I, I confirmed yesterday, people are able to design with it. There's a lot of gaps in it. We need to fill those gaps. We were looking at a lot of people in this room to help fill those gaps for the next version. One of the things that's very important and I want to emphasize because, because it was sort of lost, I think, in the discussion, this is a model code. It doesn't have to be adopted the way we've done it. It would normally be adopted similar to the way the EC code, the Euro codes are adopted. It would be adopted regionally with changes, with an appendix, with maybe other types of information. So it is a model code. Um, and, and it really builds upon, you know, the last, the, the, the work from the last 20 years. It is designed and, and is appropriate for then being adopted to looking at load and design tables. Because it's the ISO, we don't talk about species. This, we say the word bamboo. Well, that's almost silly, right? Two minutes. We, we say the word bamboo. And so, of course, bamboo is different if I'm in China, if I'm in Brazil, if I'm in Italy. So we do need to look at this from a local perspective. And it really is designed and, and, and to, to, to come up with load tables, to come up with capacity tables, so that we can design with local materials easily and help the engineer, help the architect. Um, this is then on a personal level. I really hope that the next version of this doesn't take 17 years. Uh, David and I are already talking about starting a new code cycle now so that we might have another one in about five or six years. There are a lot of research needs that are being filled in. There's a very good community that's, now that we have a standard, and this is another advantage of it, we can see the holes in it, we can see the gaps, and now we're filling in where, what we need, what's more important, and there are some issues that are less important. Um, and that's where engagement with the community. Uh, I then, uh, I have to be a little bit self-serving. There will be, um, ISO doesn't permit commentary in its codes. There is a book presently being prepared. Uh, Istruct E is going to publish it. Uh, those of us who wrote the code are writing the book. It will hopefully be ready by middle of next year. 
Um, unless I start writing right now in the back, it's not going to happen. Uh, but we have made deals with Inbar. We've made deals with Base in uh, Base Bahay in, in, in Manila. It will be available electronically for free. We want the community worldwide to be able to get this book, to get this document, and this is our design guide. This is the commentary for the code, and of course, iStruct E will also very happily sell you a paper copy for probably, I don't know, what are they gonna, what, they, they, they have high prices, don't they? Probably about 40, 50 pounds. Um, and, and so look for that in the next year, and, and we will definitely be announcing it through the community. And I believe, there we go. Uh, that's all I have to say, so hopefully I was on time. Email is there. You're always welcome to reach out to me. I, I respond to email really, really well. Um, I don't respond to phone calls or anything, so uh, feel free to get in touch with me. <laughs>